Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, thank you, Dominic. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in. Uh, thanks to the organizers for letting me present the season finale, which uh, I'm going to dedicate to the seismic modeling of Gamma Dorada stars. All right, so let's start with uh, live the land when it comes to our um, state-of-the-art stellar evolution models, um, which still uh, have uncertainties when it comes to the descriptions of chemical mixing and as well as the transportation of uh, angular momentum. So what I'm showing here is the rotation, uh, the near-core rotation rate measured for, for uh, hydrogen burning stars and for helium burning stars on the right. Um, so as stars evolve, of course, they, they, their core slow down, but they do this in a much more efficient way than what is predicted by uh, theory, which is off by about one to two orders of magnitude. Um, so if you want to, to, to see what happens uh, during the early stages of uh, stellar evolution, so during the main sequence, um, as you can see here from this typical uncertainty on the surface gravity, this is not sufficient enough to really see what stars are doing throughout the main sequence. Um, so for that, we need something better, uh, better age estimate than this uh, surface gravity. All right, so the, the aim of the game, so you start with uh, observations court, ideally a large sample, which you then couple to a first generation of models. And this gives you then estimates on, um, yeah, a, a parameters, of course, and, uh, and from the correlation set between these parameters, you can then search for clues um, what physics you're missing or what physics could be uh, the solution, which then uh, generate a second generation of models. And you can then couple this again back to the observations, and this allows you then to make more accurate uh, predictions or predict even um, new uh, parameters. And this is sort of uh, rinse and repeat until you're reaching the limits of your data. Uh, but for this, we still have quite a, a long way to go. All right, so um, a small history lesson on uh, Gamma Dorada stars. So the, the prototype Gamma Doradas, um, so the variability was already discovered in the 60s by Cousins and Warren. Um, and then about 30 years later or so, um, the similar variability was observed in Ainorgi. Um, but um, it could not yet, or it, like uh, star spots could not be ruled out as the cause of this variability. And then only in 1999, this type of uh, pulsator class was officially defined, um, where the variability was recognized to come from a high radio order, low spherical degree gravity modes. These are stars that range about 1.4 to 2 solar masses. Um, so they have a convective core throughout their main sequence and maybe a, a thin uh, convective envelope. Um, today, we know about order a thousand of uh, these uh, gamma doradas pulsators. And the excitation mechanism is believed to be the convective flux, block, uh, flux blocking mechanism. Um, although the Tesla mechanism might also be relevant for the more uh, hotter gamma door stars. So what we typically do for the gamma door stars is look at their so-called period spacing patterns. So what you do is you see in a plot on the left, you have the difference in periods um, between modes of consecutive radial order as a function of the period itself. And so if your star is chemically homogeneous and it's not rotating, this is a, a constant value in the asymptotic regime. So for uh, n much larger than L. Um, but so if we turn on rotation, um, we have uh, different effects that cause a tilt in this uh, period spacing pattern. So in first order, you have the, the Doppler shift, and just going from your co-rotating frame to initial frame. And also in the co-rotating frame itself, the effect of the rotation enters here in this lambda parameter, um, where S is the spin parameter, which is uh, twice the ratio of the period in the co-rotating frame over the uh, rotational period. And so this alpha g is uh, a constant, and this pi not parameter, or uh, buoyancy travel time, or buoyancy radius, uh, pick your favorite name. And this depends on the uh, internal structure of your star, um, which is defined by the integral of the Brunsfasel frequency over the radius. And so showing here in this plot the uh, Brunsfasel frequency in the uh, black uh, line. And the G-mode cavity is shown here uh, in green. And you see here very nicely all the GMOS frequencies and their uh, 
nodes in the in the radial direction. Uh, so not only rotation um, affects the um, the period spacing. So from the slope, you can actually measure the rotation period. I forgot to mention this, um, but also um, um, mixing in stars um, changes the period spacing pattern. So what I'm showing here on the left is the um, profile of the hydrogen mass fraction for the inner 20% of the star, and then on the right, the corresponding uh, period spacing pattern. Um, so I'm starting here already with tiny chemical gradient, so because I want to make sure the model was uh, fully relaxed. Um, but so now if we evolve it, um, you build up this chemical gradient and this causes specific modes to get trapped and this translates into these uh, characteristic dips into your uh, period spacing pattern, which becomes more and more as your star evolves and as the chemical gradient builds up. Uh, so you have chosen a model with relatively um, inefficient mixing. So when you have more efficient mixing, you kind of mix out this or wash out the chemical gradient a bit. And as a result, your dips will get less pronounced. So the, um, the fundamental parameters that we're after are, of course, the mass and age, uh, as well as the metallicity, the initial uh, hydrogen um, mass fraction. And then we have two parameters for the mixing, uh, namely the first one, um, which defines the mixing efficiency throughout the radius zone. So what I'm showing here is uh, in gray, you have the convective core where everything is instantaneously mixed. And then you have the overshoot zone. Um, so typically, um, you use either a step overshoot where you just uh, extend the core or use a diffusive um, decaying diffusive uh, overshoot. Uh, and then in the radiative envelope, you have um, the mixing defined by this the, the uh, external parameter for uh, which for now I'm taking as a constant value throughout the envelope. And so as we've seen uh, in previous seminars as well, the uh, Estimate of the overshoot score is very important if you want to do uh, um, uh, accurate age determinations, um, as the uh, overshoots will uh, uh, prolong the, the, the lifetime of the main sequence. So I'm starting out with uh, a sample of 37 gamma derived stars from a sample of Timothy Van Vee, um, for which we have uh, so the exercise make. Uh, part is based on the nominal Kepler emission data and the uh, high resolution spectroscopy from Hermes at Mikato. And so recently uh, we have like a much larger sample from uh, from Gangli. Uh, and for 90 uh, one of these stars we now also have high resolution spectroscopy from uh, Sarah Gebreus. Um, but uh, the, these 91 stars also uh, contain the 37 stars um, I'm talking about right here. Um, but so for now, I'm just focusing on this first sample of uh, 37 uh, stars. So first, I'm going to um, discuss what we can gain from just modeling the final parameter in combination with the effective temperature and surface gravity. And then in this uh, later part, I'll move on to modeling the individual uh, periods of the modes and at the Gaia luminosity as well. All right, so here you'll see the um, evolution of the uh, final parameter as a function of um, the normalized hydrogen mass fraction. So stars evolve from left to the right. Um, so as you can see, uh, as stars evolve, this um, final value decreases. So that means the modes get more uh, uh, densely spaced. Um, but what you can also see is that there is a degeneracy between mass and age. So for example, here you have um, a low uh, yeah, a low mass younger star, which can have the same final value as an older higher mass star. And you also have the generalities in the metallicity, the overshoot value, and to a lesser extent, the, uh, the value of the mixing in the radiative region and your initial hydrogen composition. Um, so from principle component analysis, we find that these last two um, parameters are least significant. Um, so for it, that's why we, uh, I will uh, fix these two to the these two central values respectively uh, for now. All right, so for, uh, here's the results from uh, for modeling just a by not in combination with the TEF and log G. Um, so I'm showing here the mass estimates for the whole sample and the age estimates color coded by the rotation frequency. Um, so we see that um, the faster rotated stars do tend to be younger. 
and we see that this uh, this mass age correlation, uh, which makes sense if you look at how the instability strip uh, is located or situated with respect to the evolution track. So the less massive stars um, will pulsate in the first part of the main sequence, and for the older ones, they only start pulsating at the uh, at the end of the main sequence. Um, so these triangles here are star for which are also detected um, Rossby modes. Um, so these are toroidal displacements, uh, which are only visible when you couple to spheroidal uh, motions uh, under the effect of rotation. And so they um, typically characterized as very spaced frequency hump, uh, just close to the rotation frequency. Um, so I'm showing again the same plot uh, in the top row here. So for step uh, overshoot and ones for exponential overshoot. And so uh, we kind of see that these stars that have Rossby modes seem to be uh, spread across the entire main sequence. Um, so from uh, using assemble modeling, so this means um, we assume that all stars adhere to the same physics, we can get a quite good estimate on the uh, mass and age estimate. Um, but as you see in the second uh, row, the overshoot is not very well constrained using um, this method, but we are quite sensitive to the mass of the uh, convective core. Um, which seem to uh, agree quite well with uh, hydrodynamical simulations, or maybe the other way around, depending on whether you're an observer or a theoretician. Um, but so what I'm showing here uh, in the work of Higa is um, the upper limit of the overshoot is a function of mass uh, color coded by these red triangles. Uh, which seems to quite uh, match quite well with the observations. And so this deviation here is because these the black dots are uh, computed for a SAMS model. And so for the more uh, massive stars, these are more evolved. Uh, hence, you have this deviation uh, right there. But in general, um, the match is quite uh, quite nice. All right. So now I'm going to move on to uh, from fitting the pi not parameter as an astroseismic uh, diagnostic to the individual uh, periods. And in this way, you don't have so much luxury of fitting uh, or fixing parameters. So you're dealing with a high dimensional space and this blows up quite fast if you uh, want to model a large sample of stars. Uh, so hence, I'm using uh, deep learning as a way to, uh, to resolve this. Um, so there's like roughly two ways you can go on about this. So you can train um, the neural network on the observations to predict the parameters. This was been done, for instance, by Or Bellinger or Mark Hahn. Um, or you can do it the other way around, where you start from uh, you train the neural network on the parameters to predict the uh, observables done by this for uh, Hendricks and Arts. Um, so I'm opting to use this. Um, Second method for um, a few reasons. So firstly, uh, you're more flexible with the number of um, parameters that, uh, that you use in the end. So you can train the neural network on the entire uh, 6D uh, grid and then later on fix parameters if necessary without having to completely retrain the neural network. Uh, secondly, uh, not all gamma door stars have the same number of observed uh, radio orders. Um, so this way allows us also to be flexible in the number of uh, observations as well. And lastly, you have more control over the modeling scheme as this way we can um, define our own merit function as I'll uh, come back to uh, later as well and how to do the, the radio order matching. So in the end, what I want is have a neural network that's trained um, on models varying in mass, XC, overshoot, the metallicity, the mixing in the uh, radiative envelope and the rotation frequency. And it will then give me the periods of the G modes and the luminosity, effective temperature, and surface gravity. Uh, so you're using MESA to uh, compute these stellar models. Um, so we vary these. Uh, uh, these parameters and the initial hydrogen content I'm setting according to the um, enrichment law from uh, Dolly Verma. And then we compute the gyre models. Um, so only the rotation enters in the, the level of the pulsation models. I'm focusing right now only on the uh, procreate dipole modes, as these are the most ubiquitous in the samples from uh, Van Rijk and Lee. 
Okay, so for the mass, I'm just covering the entire gamma door range as well as the H. Um, for the metallicity, I'm using a range that is typical to the, the gamma door sample that I'm uh, studying. The mixing, uh, the, the range of the mixing values I've used from typical values uh, from literature and the rotation rate as well from what we see uh, in the distribution of the, of the whole sample of the gamma door stars. All right, so this leaves me with about um, 39,000 pulsation models uh, for the neural network to train on. Um, so I've sampled this in two different ways. So firstly, linear. Um, so this has the advantage that you only vary one parameter at a time. So the neural network uh, um, yeah, can really learn well what the effect is of that specific parameter. Um, but we also partly um, sample the grid quasi random, as you see on the right. And so this has the advantage that you uh, sample the grid uh, or the, the, the parameter space uh, much more finely. So you kind of have uh, the best of both worlds in, in that sense. So I'm using 70% of the, of the models for training and then 30% to validate the neural network. Um, all input parameters are uh, normalized. Um, uh, apart from the uh, periods uh, for the output, uh, because these are um, uh, already in the order of unity. I'm using a technique called early stopping. So what this means is um, when the neural network um, start, so you start training the neural network for different epochs, um, for a, a fixed number of epochs. Um, but at some point, it could happen that the performance of your neural network starts to uh, decrease again. So what we then do is if the, uh, the performance uh, is not uh, improving for a few um, consecutive epochs, we then stop the training and then refer to weights back to the optimal uh, configuration where you have the least uh, or the, the lowest loss. Um, to prevent overfitting, we use a standard technique called L2 rich regulation, where you punish for weights becoming um, too large. So this is just a standard technique of uh, preventing the neural network from overfitting. Uh, and lastly, the, um, the init, so you start with an initial um, random configuration of your weights, and then the neural network tries to optimize this. But as you see, if you just slightly change the initial randomly uh, configuration of your uh, of your weights, this gives a slightly different value in the prediction. And so if you look at how these predictions are scattered, they're kind of scattered around to the true value. So what you can then do is train the neural network um, a few different times where you start with different random initial um, configurations and then average the predictions of these neural networks uh, as your final result. Um, so for this, I'm training six different networks and then average the for each period, the, uh, the prediction of these six neural networks, which greatly enhances the performance of the, of the neural network. Uh, so a good um, diagnostic to look at for neural networks is, of course, the, uh, the learning curve. So where you show the loss of the, the neural network so the performance as a function of the training epoch. And so ideally, you want to have that the training data and the validation data sort of use the same order uh, and loss, which is here. Uh, the case. So this tells us that the neural network is not overfitting or underfitting, but doing a good job at generalizing the correlations in the data. Okay, so this gives the um, ensemble for computing pulsation periods and photospheric observables, or C3PO. So C3PO comprises of the six neural networks that predict the pulsation periods for um, radial orders minus 15 to 91, with the one neural network for the luminosity. And we have one neural network that predicts the effective temperature and the surface gravity, uh, which turns out so that this configuration seems to be the most optimal to do. Uh, so I'm showing here in this plot, so we just have examples of uh, evolution tracks uh, for MESA uh, for two different metallicities and then a few different masses. And then the prediction of the neural network are the, the dots. So in general, with respect to typical uncertainties you get, this is doing a, a rather good job. All right, so next on we go to the radio order matching. So um, modeling gamma derived stars is maybe less trivial than for instance, um, fitting a, a line profile. And uh, so it's kind of not trivial how to match your observations to the model. Um, so here I'm showing an, uh, a dummy plot. So the teal um, 
dots are the uh, observed periods of um, a star, and then the white ones are the, the model. And so here you have an interruption where you are missing some uh, radio orders, for example, as is sometimes the case for these stars. So what you do is start with the shortest period uh, of the longest sequence, so uh, in this case right here, and you match this to the closest period in the model. Then you assign the consecutive radio orders of the uh, observed pattern to the consecutive radio orders of the model, and then repeat this uh, for any uh, second or third um, sequence that you may have. Sometimes it could happen that you have um, identified the same radio order in the actual model twice, and in this case, we just discard the model uh, from our uh, consideration. So this is, of course, one way to do it. Um, so I advise you to have a look at um, the paper of Matthias Mikkelsen, who has tested the effect of um, um, radio order matching on an uh, SPB star. All right, um, then secondly, so if I have um, an observation of uh, parameter A and parameter B, and I'm building a grid of models um, for which the parameters are not correlated, if A and B have the same relative uncertainty, your NBAS models will be in a concentric circle. Um, but here we're dealing with parameters that are correlated. So you kind of want to take this correlation into uh, account when you do the modeling. And this is why we use the so-called Malinobis distance, which takes this correlation uh, into account. Um, so the Malinobis distance is defined like so. So the, the white parameter gives you the, the, the sub-vector of all your periods of your model and the observations. The V is the correlation or covariance matrix, sorry. And the sigma is a diagonal matrix with the uh, uncertainties. So if you won't have this V matrix here, it would just be a normal chi square. Um, but for the sigma, we are using the, the residuals of the neural network for each radio order, um, because these are typically a bit larger than the, uh, the uncertainties on the observations. So this way also kind of take into account that the neural network is not exactly precise, uh, has the same precision for each radio order, so to say. All right, so now we're fully armed. Um, let's have a look at the modeling scheme. So um, I'm showing here and the, the white star is the uh, benchmark model and then the red star is the model that we uh, eventually recover. Uh, so what we do is we randomly sample 5,000 um, models in mass XC and overshoot uh, where we fix the metallicity uh, and the rotation period according to the measured values. And we fix the mix right now at a constant value of one centimeter squared per second. Um, technically, it sometimes could happen that you have radio orders in your observed pattern which are not um, a part of your uh, of the training of the neural network. So in that case, if in ninety percent of the cases we cannot match the specific radio order, we just automatically toss it from um, from the observations. Uh, but this rarely happens; only for a few stops. And then, secondly, uh, we find the range of mass and XC values for which the luminosity and the effective temperature and surface gravity are consistent within two sigma. So this is this um, more densely sampled box right here. Um, so the, in there, we sample them again, 15,000 models. And then in the end, we have uh, a prediction on the mass and XC for the neural network. And then we compute a very small grid around this prediction of the neural network, where we then vary the overshoot value uh, in this range right here. So in the end, I'm just constructing a very tiny uh, grid of uh, pulsation models based on the prediction of the neural network. All right, so here you can see the 68% uh, confidence intervals in mass and age for the whole sample. So in general, we do quite a good job. And for most, we can constrain it rather well compared to, uh, for example, just using PyNot. Uh, only a few stars, uh, for five stars, we are not able to match the exoseismic solution with uh, the luminosity or the spectroscopic solution. Uh, so in that case, we only rely on the pulsations, but this gives you a rather large um, uncertainty region. Uh, so as a sanity check here, I'm plotting the uh, predicted by not values for the model uh, as a function of the observed ones. Um, so I'm reminding you right now, I'm not fixing or fitting the by not with only the periods. And so we get a quite good uh, match apart from this one star right here, which is uh, also has an inconsistent measured value of pi naught compared to uh, the work from Stephen Christoph and uh, Timothy van Wiek. 
All right, so I'm going to showcase a few uh, interesting samples so, uh, or uh, examples. So the first one here is one where we do a rather good job. So if the period spacing pattern is quite smooth, uh, we are able to match the period spacing uh, pattern quite well. Um, just using this simple uh, mixing description. Uh, but for some stars, uh, we have more complicated period spacing patterns where we see that we cannot really model the uh, observed dips in the uh, period spacing pattern based on uh, on the physics that we're using right now. So this might need uh, additional physics or a different description of the mixing and radiative envelope. Uh, so one interesting story is uh, this one here. So it has also quadrupole modes, um, so it has these very characteristic dips. So we, uh, for this uh, story, also try to test the uh, an exponent. Uh, sorry, a step overshoot function uh, to see whether this gives a much better fit. Um, but in terms of uh, matching the uh, the trapped modes, we're not doing a much better job switching from an exponential overshoot to a step overshoot. Um, so secondly, if I have to go to a very uh, low uh, demixing levels to even try to sort of match the order of the um, period spacing dips, um, which is in quite contrast with what's measured in SBB stars, uh, for its range typically from tens of the square per second to about a million. And so for uh, this star kick, um, one, two, oh, and this has a very characteristic dip in the period spacing pattern. Um, so as a sanity sector, tried to see if we could also match uh, this dip with um, uh, just from, from mode trapping. Uh, so as you can see, if you go to very low um, mixing levels that the uh, you induce sort of this dip around the, the observed one, but you also create these additional ones, uh, which are more observed in the model. So this kind of confirms that this dip is indeed uh, caused by mode, uh, mode interaction has been uh, Upon by uh, by Rita, for example, and I give you the side. Uh, so yeah, in this case, if we go to the individual mode periods, we can uh, model the overshoot uh, quite well. Um, but we don't really see any correlation between the mass and the overshoot parameter, as uh, was, for example, the, uh, found in Clarence Torres uh, in the case of eclipsing binaries. Um, but we, yeah, we do find quite a large range of uh, overshoot values, um, which are sometimes also a bit larger than what is predicted by Clara and Torres as well. Um, but we don't really uh, yeah, see a clear correlation between the mass and the overshoot. Uh, but we also, yeah, uh, probably quite a small mass range as well. Um, so we can see if this uh, overshoot parameter correlates with the um, the rotation frequency of the star. Um, so what's shown here is the extent of the overshoot uh, region. Um, so in physical distance as a function of the rotation period scaled with uh, sort of a natural frequency of the uh, convective core. So the mass, uh, this is the mass and the radius of the convective core. Um, but so whether I scale this or not, there's not really a very clear correlation between the amount of overshoot that you need and the, the, the rotation of the star. So this suggests that it's not purely induced by, uh, by rotational shear, for example. All right, so here I'm showing now the uh, rotation frequency as a function of the actual physical uh, age of the star. Um, as you can see, there's not really a very clear correlation as well when we just switch from log g to the uh, absolute age. Um, but again, these uh, triangles are stars for us being able to, to indeed find across the entire mean sequence. Um, so what I'm showing here as well is the, the angular momentum of the, of the core normalized to the total angular momentum as a function of stellar age. Um, and what we observe is that the the evolution of the angular momentum throughout the main sequence is kind of consistent with what you would just expect if you are uh, because of the, the, the changes in the size of the core uh, along the main sequence. Uh, so these two are just uh, non rotating models um, where it just show the um, angular momentum of the core when we assume um, rigid rotation throughout the whole star. So we don't really observe a very strong coupling or a um, 
transfer between the angular momentum in the core and the radius of envelope. Um, so if we neglect the mass loss and assume a rigid rotation, we can then backtrack what the rotation should have been at the uh, zero eight main sequence. Um, so I'm showing that right here. So what you said is a, sort of also a Gaussian distribution, but it peaks more around um, two cycles per day, whereas the present one seems to peak around one cycle per day. Um, we can also see how the distribution looks like in rotation with uh, or how fast stars are rotating with respect to the critical rush rotation. Um, so what you see here is that the distribution is sort of Gaussian distributed um, around 50% critical where the fastest ones seem to rotate to 80% critical of the rush rotation. Um, so if we, uh, instead of just using the rotation frequency, use the uh, present rotation frequency over the rotation frequency that they started with at the sums, then you see quite a nice uh, pattern that the stars slow down as they evolve. And these uh, tracks right here come from uh, rotating mist models, uh, rotating at 40% critical. And so there we get quite a, uh, quite a good match actually. All right, so I want to dedicate the, uh, the last few minutes of the talk to uh, the new generation of models, which will be with atomic diffusion. Um, so I'm using this as an umbrella term for thermal diffusion, concentration diffusion, uh, gravitational settling, and relative levitation as well. Um, so atomic diffusion has already been shown that it's quite relevant in A and F stars, for example, by Martin Liu. Um, so here I'm showing uh, the relative levitation uh, acceleration induced for different elements as a function of um, a, a temperature throughout the star. And the uh, log g um, is the local gravity. So in some cases, you see that the order of magnitude is the, uh, they have the same order of magnitude for these stars. So uh, indeed, relative levitation is quite relevant in uh, A and F stars. Um, so yeah, the, the trick is with uh, relative levitation or uh, diffusion in general, so that your opacity and the relative levitation itself depend on the local fraction um, of the local composition of the of the cell that you're looking at. And so as your uh, diffusion starts to work, you have a different composition in each cell, and so that's why you have to uh, rely on the monochromatic opacity tables uh, to compute your Rosland opacity and as well the, uh, uh, the rate of levitation. Um, so this generates a lot of extra computation time. Uh, so I spent a few uh, few months on my PhD completely rewriting the current uh, diffusion routines and uh, OP mono routines in MESA together with Aaron Dotter. Um, so we're trying to be a bit more uh, economic on how you um, um, compute the um, the opacities and the radiative levitations. Uh, so in this case, we can actually run a model quite fast, so in 37, 36 cores uh, within half an hour, just from three main sequence to the temps. And also a lot of convergence problems seem to be solved for now. So this will be a part of the new MESA release, um, so stay tuned for that. Um, but for now, I'm focusing on uh, the modeling with diffusion I've done for two slowly rotating stars, uh, which was still with the old uh, diff or the default diffusion routines in ASA. Um, so what you see here is for one slowly rotating gamma door star. So the um, this has uh, three observed um, azimuthal orders, uh, which are indicated by these dashed lines, which mark the uh, observational width as well of the of the period, so rather small. Um, so we've done this once. Uh, just models without atomic diffusion, once with atomic diffusion, where both of the cases we uh, set the initial metallicity uh, to the metallicity from uh, observed from spectroscopy, and once we've done it with atomic diffusion, but setting the metallicity to solar metallicity. Um, so these are the, the, the different rows that you see here, the different symbols. So in this case, um, what we find is that the models without diffusion seem to give a better match in the pulsation frequencies. Um, so that it doesn't mean, of course, that diffusion doesn't happen, but there are other processes that might counteract its effects. Um, 
And here for another star, so you might recognize this from the Shiki seminar as well, uh, so it's a very uh, slowly rotating star. And in this case, we find that when we turn on atomic diffusion, we get a much better fit on the, uh, on the, on the observed periods of this star. Um, and for this case, we couldn't find uh, a good match when we set the initial metallicity to the solar metallicity. So for this star, it has a very, very low uh, metallicity. Uh, so looking at the uh, surface abundances, so what we assume is an initial uh, mixture compared uh, uh, according to the Asplund mixture, um, which seems to be quite reasonable for uh, gamma door stars. Uh, so what you see here is the evolution. Um, so the, the dashed line is the one, the model without diffusion, and then the black line is the one, or the, the solid line, the one where you have turned on diffusion and these um, Shaded regions are the one and two sigma uh, observed surface abundances from the Galeida. And so the red lines mark where the uh, best age estimate is. So you want to see where this intersection is. Um, and so in some cases, we actually find a much better match. So for example, so the sodium abundance, we can better explain um, as well as the nitrogen abundance and a bit also the iron abundance. Um, uh, sorry, uh, nickel abundance. Um, so in general, we are a bit better at explaining the observed um, surface abundance for this star when we also turn on atomic diffusion. And in some cases we don't. Um, so this could just be that the initial um, abundance of this element was, uh, was not correct. Um, all right, so there's still a lot that remains to be done. Um, so work, right now I'm also working on um, just more generalizing the effect of atomic diffusion in combination with other types of mixing and see what the effect is on the, uh, on the G modes and on the surface abundances as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have now a larger sample of gamma door size for which we also have high resolution spectroscopy. Um, so effectively doubling the, the sample size. Um, uh, yeah, for the faster rotating stars, I'm right now also working to lose on modeling these uh, in 2D with uh, the STF and uh, top code. Uh, so I'm showing here the example of one of the fastest rotating stars. So in the, for the STF model, it's about uh, rotating at 50% critical, where the flat mean is about 10%. Uh, so they would have uh, assumed that um, 2D effects uh, start to become important. Uh, all right, so the, that's uh, that's the end. Uh, so I'm leaving you here with uh, with my conclusions, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Joey. Um, hopefully, the audience noticed that Joey is also the king of acronyms here in Leuven uh, because uh, he likes to come up with those. And so, hopefully, everyone spotted those when they were sprinkled throughout the talk. If you have a question, then uh, please raise your hand so I can see you. Okay, so while people are thinking, oh no, okay, Vicky, go ahead. Um, hi, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Joy, for your very nice talk and congratulations for the great work you've done. I was wondering on slide 27, maybe you could put it up again. You were showing, I think, the absolute uh, ages of your sample. I, uh, let me see. I wrote it down even. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> uh, slide 27, you say? Oh, maybe I was wrong. Uh, yes, 20. Uh, yeah. This one. Yes. Yeah. So this one. Yes, on the left side. So I was, I was always kind of um, confused why we don't see any gamma door stars on the postman sequence. I was wondering if you find anything that might, sh uh, might look like uh, postman sequence gamma door stars. Um. Yeah, for, for this sample, we mostly just see them uh, right. so also not, not them. even up yeah. to uh, very close to hydrogen exhaustion. So the, yeah, the only star that comes very close is the one that I showed before with the atomic diffusion, so big uh, one, uh, one, one, uh, 45. Yeah, um, yeah, that but, one is crazy, uh, right? Yeah, is but, not yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. that one is actually yeah. not in, in, in this sample uh, right here. So. The stars that I'm looking at here are even less evolved mm -hmm. than, uh, than that one. 
Okay, so, so your sample, I mean, that was kind of the follow up question. So your sample is basically a young sample, as I can see here. Um, I yes, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. Uh, my mind what the, the lifetime yes. on the main sequence is for, for a high mass gamma door stars. Uh, star. um, yeah, so it depends on your overshoot, but if you uh, your degree, right. yeah, yeah, of course. So. Uh -huh. Okay. Good, uh, but yeah, because we're mostly looking at uh, slightly lower mass stars, so they start to pulsate yeah, yeah, a bit yeah, earlier yeah. than. Uh, yeah, so we also lack quite uh, very massive massive stars actually um, for those you expect them to be more. Well, above. it's good to start with the easy ones first, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm not seeing any other hands. For the moment, so I'm going to ask a question. Um, I think it was slide 25, Joey. So if you go back to um, this one, yes. So you have you have a few stars that, that seem to be bumping up against the uh, the top right hand corner of your of your diagram on the right. Can you perhaps comment on that? Are these stars that we expect the 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 core boundary mixing to be extremely high? Uh, so for for these stars right here, sure. Um, yeah, so it's mostly because some of these stars have very complicated um, period spacing patterns that we're not able to match uh, very well, and as a result, the uh, overshoot is also a bit uh, less constrained, uh, or in some cases where we don't have uh, a good agreement with the luminosity and the effective temperature to break this degeneracy, and there you're also quite prone to then. Be uh, these degeneracies as well. So out of the luminosity and the uh, the structure in the period spacing pattern, which of those two do you think is is predominantly more important for these high FOV stars? Um, I would say probably the, the degeneracies that you are, are not able to resolve very well uh, based on uh, the, the luminosity and effective temperature. Okay. Patrick, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So thanks a lot uh, for this very interesting presentation. I have just a question about the transport of angular momentum because I'm not sure to have fully understand. Do, do you find that there is no strong coupling between the core and the, the envelope? Um, yes, so it's let me go back to you it. Uh, I'm not sure to understand the point here. Um, yeah, so what I'm yeah, showing here is just the, the angular momentum uh, in the core, assuming that the core rotates with the same uh, omega as the, the rest of the star, the convective envelope. Um, so, of course, uh, if your core starts to shrink, you would expect that uh, the rotation frequency starts to change as well. Um, so, what we see in, in, in this plot is that just the change that we observe uh, for these sample of stars seems to be quite. Uh, yeah, in, in line with what you would just expect if there's not really any transportation of angular momentum, but just from the, the core changing its size. Uh, but so that would mean, of course, that you need to have um, uniform rotation throughout the main sequence evolution. Okay, but I, I'm not sure to understand how this compares to previous results from, uh, I don't know, for instance, from Rita or from uh, Ideyuki and uh, Umin Lee, for instance, who see that it seems to me that as far as I understand in Gamador, it's very flat. So if we need to keep during the evolution of a star a very low contrast between the core and the envelope, at a given point, there is a strong coupling <laughs> between the core and the envelope. This is why I do not understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The... Well, yeah, this is still something I need to work out in, uh, in, in much more detail. So this is just a uh, yeah, very first estimate to see how, how this, uh, the, the angular momentum behaves as a function of the, of the age. And also perhaps um, a quick question about the values of the mixing parameter that you find. You find one centimeter per second. And oh, yes, yeah. So in, in general, for the, most of these stars, they have a very flat uh, period spacing pattern, and for this, uh, get, you you dips are already washed out if you have uh, one centimeter square per second. But you see, one yeah. centimeter square per second, or, or 0 0.05, it's uh, no mixing. <laughs> I don't know how you can. Yes, yes. You, you mean that these values are way too low than what you would expect. Something in a model, you need, I don't know, 10 to the power of three or four, one. 
There is no mixing. Uh, it, is, it is indeed um, quite low. So one thing what could happen is um, if atomic diffusion is at play, so then because of settling, you will have um, sort of natural way to uh, get rid of your dips of it. Um, so if you would just have atomic diffusion without any mixing, you see that yours, yeah, your, your dips completely disappear. So then you need actually to turn up the mixing to sort of counteract the effect of, uh, of gravitational settling. Okay, so, so maybe if we uh, yeah include atomic diffusion in these stars, then you are allowed to go up to much higher uh, mixing values, or maybe not like if you uh, take constant profile, but if for example you use uh, shear mixing profile, it also seems to work best for most of the SPV stars, uh, where you have like a dip in, in uh, so you have a very low mixing efficiency just outside of the core, and then you have a much higher efficiency. Um, to add the, the relative envelope. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Jörn, go ahead, please. Thank, thank you for this, uh, this very nice analysis. It's wonderful to see these stars being used. Uh, they're, they're so much more difficult than the solar like stars that I'm working on, so that's very impressive. Uh, but I, I may have missed something in, in your pre uh, comparison of the period spacings between the observations and the models. So could you go back to the uh, slides? A specific one? No, I, 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 I can't remember. Just in, yeah, that's, uh, okay, yeah, that's let's, let's, one. That, that, one, that one is fine. Uh, so what I don't understand is that in, if, you, if we look at the low one, that you don't match the oscillations in the, in the period spacing, which of course is a very strong diagnostics. Uh, so does that mean that there's no uh, glitch behavior in, in, in the models, either in, in the uh, net, neural network or, and, or directly computed so models? It, it, yeah, so um, for the, it's not the default of the neural network. So um, I'm not using it on the, on the dipole mode. So here the prediction of the neural network is uh, in red. And then afterwards, I also compute an, uh, a real GIA model to see uh, also if the neural network does a good job. Um, but even yeah, for the the, the Mesa and Jaya model that we compute afterwards, uh, yeah, we find that if we just use a dmix even of one centimeter square per second, the tips are already completely completely gone. Uh, because, so, because, yeah. because of course uh, that oscillation is a very strong diagnostic of the uh, mixing in the, in the boundary layer. So I'm, I'm a bit surprised. Yes, yes. That's, uh, yeah. So um, this is a definitely a uh, slide that I'm still. Uh, um, following up on. Um, so this was this yeah, first estimate to see for the large mm. sample of stars what we can do in terms of mass uh, age estimates and overshoot. Um, but indeed, for some of these stars where we have these dips, there's much more to gain in terms of the uh, the internal mixing as well. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I've noticed it's, it's extremely hard to match uh, to yeah, get these these dips. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're not asking <laughs> you to. <laughs> We are asking you to do it not because it's easy, because but because it's hard. Yeah, yeah. and especially yeah, as I said before, with atomic diffusion. So once you turn it on, it completely yeah mm -hmm. uh, diminishes the chemical gradient, and then your di your dips completely disappear as well. Um, yeah, so it's still something I'm really trying to do, but it's uh, yeah, it's an extremely hard job to, uh, yeah. to okay. really match the, the dips of the. Of the right. Pattern. Thank you. I know that uh, Rita has a question as well, so please go ahead. Yeah, sorry, but it, it was very much in line with, with what Jörn uh, just says. Um, I, I just I just am puzzled by, by this, um, the, the fact that um, we, we know that um, from, from Andrea Miglio's work that uh, uh, these dips, this, the, this trapping is directly and the and, 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 and the characteristics of this trapping is directly related to to many too easy things that we can uh, retrieve, uh, such as the, the number of nodes that are in one pattern that's related to uh, basically uh, the, the location of the, of the of, if you want, the glitch, and, uh, and also the, the, the amplitude of the oscillation that's, that's related to uh, uh, the, the, the sharpness of, of the, the glitch. And so I was, I was thinking when, when I mean, I think it's not the only star for which uh, you, you don't uh, manage to match this trapping. And I was wondering, um, so if you had any critical opinion on the prescription that you use, uh, and if you 
uh, could, if, if you had the perfect uh, stellar evolution code, what would you like to see there that could maybe uh, solve this, this question? Uh, I mean, you, you already started to answer, but uh, um, yeah, just uh, so what's the proportion of stars for which you managed to, to, to fit those glitches? And uh, um, so, what, yeah, really fitting the, the glitches exactly, that's yeah, not really possible for any of the stars right now. So, um, yeah, what I would like to, to do is at first include atomic diffusion as well, which then allows you to much better calibrate the, the mixing profile. And um, so right now, I think that shear mixing where you have like a very low efficiency just outside of the core and then a much higher efficiency, which washes out the effects of atomic diffusion a bit much further out, uh, could be uh, one of the solutions for this. So yeah, I think we should look at the direction of uh, a rotational mixing in this case. But so how, how confident can, can you therefore be on your determination of the F overshoot, for instance, when you see that, I, I have to admit that it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, a little question mark on, on the determination of the extent of the convective mm -hmm. core and things like that. What, what, what would you, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, so the, um, um, yeah, if you only look, really look at the, the extent of the tip, so this is only very relevant for the, the, uh, with the mixing in the radiative zone. Um, but yeah, of course, the uh, offshoot influences your dips as well a bit, but it also has an effect on each of the mode periods. Um, so in that case, if you don't even completely match the dips, um, if you have a good model that is consistent with the luminosity, the effect of temperature, and surface gravity, um, then I would um, not be super worried that the, the value is, is too far off, or in some cases, we also just find that the, uh, yeah, the uncertainty region is just very large. But yeah, I, I agree with you that, of course, if, if you want to do much more accurate um, overshoot um, estimates for these stars where you have the mode trapping, that uh, yeah, we need to, to match these uh, much better as well. But yeah, for a large, uh, the majority of the sample, we have quite a smooth pattern. Um, so there, I'm, uh, we're quite confident that it's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see Ms. Al, uh, please go ahead. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Oh, thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, my question about is about the excitation of gamma drug stars. And you showed in some slide, uh, theoretical instability strip. And one, I'm wondering whether the models you constructed are all located in that strip or not. Um, so, so what you mean is that the models that I find, the MESA models, whether they are yeah. in the um, observed yeah. instability set. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, theoretical instability strip. Yes, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't give you an absolute answer right now, but I haven't tested it whether they are like completely within the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the boundaries. But uh, yeah, as I explained before, we at least uh, discovered this uh, mass age correlation, which uh, yeah, seems to be in line with how the, uh, the instability strip is formed. But yeah, I, I, I do not know exactly whether all of the stars uh, fall within this, uh, this instability strip. Uh, if some of the stars are located outside the theoretical instability, instability strip, are you happy to claim that the theoretical prediction is not accurate enough? Yes, but yeah, it also depends, of course, a lot of on the treatment of, uh, of confection. So I'm, I'm yeah, 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 so if I can do this one one to one comparison uh, as well, because yeah, of course, I have to make an assumption on the alpha uh, uh, MLT parameter as well. Um, so yeah, playing with this could also I mean, shift the stars a bit. Okay, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the plot you will make. Yes, okay, so all right, I'll, uh, I'll put it on my, on my to-do list. Thank you. Thanks very much, Masao. So we have reached the end of the hour, so I think that's a good place to, to close. And I'll pass over to uh, Rita and thank Joey once again for a, a fantastic talk. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Joey, for, for your talk. And, and thank you, Dominic, uh, for uh, handling the whole things around. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining uh, for this last seminar. And um, um, we will keep you posted and, and inform you of the, uh, how we resume and, and, and so on. So it was very, very nice for me to and for, for the steering committee to to, uh, to animate such a, such a nice initiative. And uh, thank you all for attending and uh, supporting and uh, asking questions, talking, and so on. Thank Bye -bye. you. May, may, may I just uh, research before you start? Sure. Thank you for, for this uh, wonderful idea. We've had some fantastic talks in, in, uh, in, in the spring that we would not have had otherwise, much better than uh, the talks at conferences. <laughs> which would have been short and, and um, mm. difficult to follow. So, so I agree completely that we, we should continue with this for a while at least. And, and um, we, we should all be very grateful to you and, and your organizing committee for putting all this together. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, I think maybe even when we have still resume conferences and so on, maybe it's, it, it, there's there's space for this uh, this uh, series to to remain and, and uh, so okay so we will uh, keep you informed thank you very much everyone for your contributions and uh, see you hopefully in september <laughs> bye 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 have a nice summer bye 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 thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye good holidays happy holidays <laughs> Um, the steering committee is welcome to stay for, for a chat after this. Thank you, Joey. Thank you very much. Good luck for yes, the Yes, thank you as well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Great. So, uh, let me just, I'm, I'm sorry, Rafa, I will remove you. <laughs> yes, okay. Can we stop the recording as well? Yes.